Welcome. 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 The internet was originally created by a government defense agency, but it quickly became a platform for the growth of a new industry worldwide, offering a wide range of attractive products and services. As the web became popular with hundreds of millions of users, intelligence agencies like the NSA decided to use it for its own purposes. An instrument for global communication soon became a tool for massive spying, part of a surveillance industrial complex. The vast super-secret National Security Agency took to the Internet like a fish takes to water. There is an often invisible but deep connection between a high-tech government intelligence service and the corporate world, as well as tensions between the companies, their customers, and the government. It works on many levels. First, the intelligence agency works with thousands of businesses who offer services and provide contractors. Some of the big ones are on an NSA advisory panel, and others are deeply complicit with its global spying and surveillance mission. The same time that many are criticizing government spying, customers are pressuring their phone and Internet companies, accusing them of violating their privacy. Here's one case documented in this chart shown in a lawsuit proving that AT&T set up a special room to intercept calls the government wanted to spy on. All of this collusion upsets the CEO of another tech company, Roy Singham of ThoughtWorks. The sad part about this is it's really uh, something that has undermined commerce, it's undermined privacy, it's undermined security. It is so hypocritical what these companies and governments have done to something that could have been so revolutionary, so important to human race, this globalization of an internet economy. And we, it's been destroyed, quite frankly, by this collaboration. The NSA is proud of its partnerships with many companies, as these documents released by Edward Snowden makes clear. The agency has made deals with corporations to provide data in exchange for information on threats against their operations, as these formerly secret documents show. This relationship is documented in journalist Glenn Greenwald's book, No Place to Hide. This leaked graphic refers to what NSA calls strategic partnerships, 80 major global corporations in all, including well-known computer, telephone, and Internet companies. This graphic outlines the specific targets of NSA collection. Email, video and voice chats, photos, stored data, and more. This document for fiscal year 2012 shows a 32% increase in cooperation from over 45,000 companies. The agency reports a strong growth in data from Google, up 63%, Facebook, up 131%, and Skype, up 248%. We asked NSA whistleblower Russ Tice about these partnerships. It seems as if a lot of the technology companies are actually being paid to share their, quote, data with the NSA. Absolutely. And, and, and in some respects, I have, a, I have a little bit of sympathy for some of these companies because it's a carrot and a stick. Now, the carrot is, oh, by the way, we're going to pay you millions and tens of millions of dollars and, and beef up your, your bottom line for this information. The stick is, if you don't give us the information, we're gonna make life miserable for you. We're going to cut back on your government contracts and as, as the CEO of, of uh, Quest Communications found out, um, we're going to put you in jail if we can find some nitty gritty thing that we can pin on you. And I think he just got out of jail just a couple months ago. Companies are often ordered to supply information for which they are paid. This is an actual court document showing that NSA requests to a foreign intelligence surveillance court results in orders to the company. The companies like this process because they can then claim they are being forced to cooperate and not because of all the money they make. So in other words, there is intimidation, actually. This is really almost mafia-like. Absolutely. 
This is extortion and blackmail. But some of these companies engage in spying themselves. Challenges to Google's use of Street View cars seems on its way to the Supreme Court. Their role has the attention of Martin Smith, a producer at the PBS Frontline program. Smith says that businesses in Silicon Valley help create the surveillance state. That the cell phone that you carry tracks everything, uh, everywhere you go. Uh, it increasingly tracks what you buy. Uh, your email is scanned so that advertisements can be placed, but it's creating a turnkey surveillance state that is, uh, that everybody is participating in. It's not just journalists and their sources, but everybody is exposed. Their information, they are, Google knows more about you than any institution on the planet at this point. But these companies want you to sign privacy agreements. They, they claim to be protecting your privacy. Well, they are. They do have privacy agreements, and if you took the time to read them, uh, perhaps you could make a rational decision, but you'd never get out of, uh, out of your house. Uh, you, you'd be there reading these privacy agreements for uh, months on end. Alfredo Lopez runs an Internet business to empower citizens. You're a customer of a company. You sign a privacy agreement with them. They want you to, you know, they... they have an implied contract with you That's to right. to uh, actually ensure that your data is treated confidentially in private. Right. But they've broken that, haven't they? Many of them. They broke. They've broken it, and they also re you have to really be careful. Google collaborates with the U.S. government. It's on a bunch of committees with the U.S. government, and its privacy and pr data protection agreement is has more holes than a piece of Swiss cheese. So they can do literally anything they want with your data. In fact, Gmail, Google writes into its Gmail agreement the ability to actually read your email. They claim it's for marketing purposes. But the same apparatus they use to read your email can also be used by some government official to figure out what, um, you know, what, it is you're talking to, what it is you're talking about and who it is you're talking to. So this is a battleground, isn't it? Uh, between, you know, the, the desire of people to communicate without being spied on and the insistence by the government to spy on them. That is correct. The companies require privacy agreements like these that customers think protect them, but many of these agreements are written by lawyers who know how to conceal or sanitize their real meaning. The language is deceptive, writes critic Wolf Richter. They're all doing it. They're part of the enormously hyped bubble of big data whose business model is to collect and monetize your personal information, which has become part of a new asset class. And seeing this, the NSA is dying of data envy. At the same time, initially at least, most of the big companies would not discuss their involvement or deny it. Larry Page of Google said, press reports that suggest that Google is providing open-ended access to our users' data are false, period. Facebook's chief security officer, Joe Sullivan, said, we do not provide any government organization with direct access to Facebook servers. Later, Mashable reported, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and other tech giants knew of the existence of the secret NSA surveillance program, PRISM. NSA's general counsel says tech companies were aware of PRISM, they just didn't know it was called that. Early on in the um, debate, there were um, some statements by companies who may or may not have been involved in the program saying, well, we never heard of PRISM. But whether they ever heard of PRISM, any company that was from whom information was being obtained under 702 knew that it was being obtained. Correct. PRISM is just an internal government term that as a result of the leaks became a public term. But collection under this program is done pursuant to compulsory legal process that any recipient company would have received. According to Tom Jelton, a correspondent for National Public Radio, the NSA and many companies signed on to an ESF, Enduring Security Framework, to work together in a mutually rewarding way. 
As part of what's called the Enduring Security Framework, chief executives of top U.S. corporations are brought to Washington two or three times a year for a one-day classified briefing. For each session, the CEOs get special top-secret clearances so they can be told about the latest in cyber weaponry. They can then go back to their companies and take steps to deal with the threats they hear about, threats they may not previously have taken seriously. Suddenly, tech companies began spending millions to boost their images. Right now, we, we exist in a surveillance state. It's, I have no doubt in my own mind that we have you know, the, the corporate uh, players and the government, the government spies have put in place a mechanism where they can monitor almost everything uh, at real time. Um, and and to, to assume that our secret policies you know, which are judged by, by courts that are secret uh, and, and uh, issue mandates that are secret, to, to believe that this secret mechanism will safeguard us from devolving into a police state, I think is really the height of recklessness. Al Jazeera published emails showing a close personal relationship between Google execs and NSA. No wonder journalist Glenn Greenwald says... There almost is no division between the private sector and the NSA, or the private sector and the Pentagon when it comes to the American national security state, they really are essentially one. Here's just one list of NSA private contractors. And this, is, this goes back before 9-11. The NSA was increasingly, in the, in the internet age, was increasingly going out to the defense, military industrial defense intelligence complex and granting very, very large contract vehicles in the billions and billions of dollars to quote unquote solve the big data problem, to solve the intelligence problem of, of the digital age. Former NSA executive Thomas Drake told us a less expensive in-house surveillance program was later junked and replaced by one built by a private contractor, SAIC, at a much higher cost. The dark secret, right, which I've continued to talk about, is that the very best of American in June innovation had already solved the problem. They just chose to ignore it. One particular program was called Thin Thread. And it was developed for just over $3 million, but it didn't stand a chance against a program called Trailblazer, which was $4 billion. When it was awarded it with great fanfare as a flywheel contract, the flagship program, in which would, it would take NSA into the digital age. And that was in the spring of 2000. In fact, I was, again, told by my, the number three who I reported to, it says, you know, you got to be at least 10 million to even get noticed. And two, you know, Thin Thread was, came out of a, uh, it was a signals, um, we call it Signals Intelligence Automation Research Center, otherwise known as SARC, which is, it was really a, a, a center of excellence for... But it was internal. Internal, had about a dozen people, right? And guess what? It was replaced yep. by a well, $4 billion dollar project. That $4 billion project had been already awarded. It was the corporate solution. You, weren't, you did not challenge the corporate solution. Even though the, the acquisition regulations, the contract regs, require you to determine if there are any alternatives or existing solutions that, that, that meet the requirements. They just, because you're outsourcing. This was a choice, a strate another critical strategic decision that was made by General Hayden, which was we're gonna buy the solution, not make it. There was no in between. Working for spy agencies can become a company's profit center. The conglomerate that Edward Snowden worked for reportedly made over a billion dollars servicing defense agencies like NSA. Silicon Valley is escalating pressure on President Barack Obama to curb the U.S. government surveillance programs that vacuum personal information off the Internet and threaten the technology industry's financial livelihood. A coalition that includes Google, Apple, Yahoo, Facebook, and Microsoft lashed out in an open letter printed Monday in major newspapers. The crusade united eight companies that often compete fiercely against each other but now find themselves banding together to limit the potential damage from revelations about the National Security Agency's snooping on web surfers. 
As exposés of the corporate role mounted, foreign companies no longer wanted to do business in America. There are reports rolling in saying that U.S. businesses are feeling fallout overseas from the NSA spying revelations. You normally wouldn't make the connection, but other countries are actually thinking twice now about buying goods that are made by U.S. companies. Even Julian Assange of WikiLeaks commented on how American companies were being hurt. You know, I've been involved in the tech industry for a long time. Uh, I know my friends in the U.S. are really hurting as a result of NSA, uh, of what has happened in the NSA. As far as the outside world is concerned, uh, the United States has become an archipelago of coercion, uh, where any person you were dealing with in business at Google or Facebook or Yahoo or at a tel telecommunications company might have become secretly uh, an agent of the National Security Agency because they're ordered to do so. Uh, by the FISA court, and they're forced to keep that secret, uh, or through the mechanism of national security letters. One study reported that the U.S. cloud computing industry could lose as much as $36 billion in business. Even as companies challenged NSA access, a top-secret court that oversees surveillance has time and time again ruled for the NSA. Some companies like Microsoft published a secret internal manual to show employees how to cooperate with government requests. This one was leaked. This manual shows that the company set up a special portal for government agencies to make requests. Google decided to publicize the growing number of requests for information they were receiving to show how transparent they are. Then, for PR reasons, many companies began pressuring the government publicly to reform NSA. You know, so frankly, I, I, I think that the, the government blew it, right? I think that they blew it on communicating um, what they were, basically the balance of what they were going for uh, here with this. So, um, you know, we, the morning after this started breaking, there were like a bunch of people asked them what they thought. It would, would, like, and the, the government's comment was, oh, don't worry, basically we're not spying on any Americans. Right? And it was like, oh, wonderful. Yeah, it's like, that's really helpful to companies who are trying to serve people around the world and they're really going to inspire confidence in American internet companies. It's like, thanks for, for going out there and being really clear about what you're doing. Um, so I, I think that that was really bad. Some companies are now defying the NSA. Others say the government is irresponsibly blaming them unfairly. The tech industry is less thrilled that the White House is shining a light on their data collection practices through its big data report. Companies issued statements urging the White House to turn its attention back to how the NSA collects private data. Criticizing them, they say, is irresponsible. I mean, we haven't had this kind of arrogance of American corporate government uh, language, in my opinion, since the 50s. You know, when it's, what's good for General Motors is good for America. And I think it's time that the businesses in the rest of the world took notice of this uh, monopolization by U.S. corporations and said, this is not good for our countries, it's not good for our clients, it's not good for our customers, it's not good for the world. At the same time, they have made videos like this to show the public how they handle requests for information on their customers. In the course of a criminal investigation, sometimes the government requests information on Google users. Here's how we protect users' information from excessive requests, while also following the law. Let's say the federal authorities want information from Google about user HughDunnit22. Google protects your rights by upholding the Fourth Amendment, the law requires authorities to use a search warrant when seeking private content, like email. If there's enough evidence to support an application for a search warrant, the investigator heads to court. The judge inspects the application, and if satisfied, issues a search warrant. To Alfredo Lopez, videos like this give the impression that these companies are being sensitive to customer concerns. They say a range of things. Most of the time, the people that we interact with and the bodies that I'm with and you know, when I go to different activities, the, you know, with hot seat tatsi people where they pay, they pay for your lunch and dinner, um, I, they say, you're right, Alfredo, um, and we're working on that. Or it's another... See, everything is so compartmentalized and divided that it's a self-protection. They can protect themselves. They also... Here is the problem. To see the picture this way, you have to have the politics to see the picture. 
And that's what I keep saying to people that I talk to all the time. I think as a somebody in the tech sector, something that's more um, upsetting to me is the lack of vigilance in the first place of the corporations and their hypocrisy in the defense of this. And they have no real plan to put pressure on the United States government or international bodies to protect their other citizens. Listen, we're a global business. You know, I operate in 30 countries. We have people working, I think, in 15 uh, countries right now. We have consumers. We have businesses in all these countries. Most global businesses do. Whom am I accountable to? Am I not accountable to my client in India or to my client in South Africa? Of course I am. I, you can't pretend that you like global business and then you think it's okay that one country and one set of companies, uh, countries, corporations have this unlimited license to exploit and spy on the rest of the world. You cannot proceed from the premise that the government has the right to conduct surveillance against you or anyone else. It does not have that right under the Constitution of the United States. It says it clearly. And, you know, all this stuff about, well, we have to surveil criminals and terrorists and everything. How you know someone's a criminal? And how do you know someone's a terrorist? Why are you taking my email? If these companies can collect this information, so can the government. Martin Smith's Frontline series exposed corporate collusion with the NSA. The Googles, the Facebooks, collect as much of our sensitive data as possible. But anything you hand to a private company is potentially the government. The NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. Corporate America and national security state know so much about us. And we know so little about them. I do see it as one of the stories of our time. It affects us all here as to whether or not we're going to be adequately informed about what our government is doing and that we do have a First Amendment of free speech and, and a Fourth Amendment uh, that need uh, on, on, you know, search and seizure. We need protections. They need to be upheld. Donald Byrd teaches journalism at Long Island University. He says not all of his students even recognize the problem. Our students think that the Internet is just a utility. You turn it on and it runs. It's water, electricity, whatever. And the Internet really has to be the same. And they're on their machines all the time. I, I took a train to Chicago and back recently uh, because my son's at Northwestern University. And the kids, they're all on their screens. They're not talking to each other. They're never going to meet a significant other. Many of them may not know, may not care, that other people are paying attention to what they're actually saying or they're recording what they're saying. They're being monitored. They're being spied oh, I know on. That. I know that. I tell them that when I go into my Bank of America, there are 14 cameras on me, watching me. There are cameras everywhere, we know that, and so forth. And I tell them never to text anything they wouldn't want their mother to read. Is privacy dead then? I mean, personal privacy? I think so. I think it is. So in a sense, the NSA, by its desire to control everything, has actually led to the global resistance to it. This is about economic, military, political, ideological, historical control. This is the fundamental nature of power in the world. Whoever controls the commanding heights of the new world economy, which is the internet, dominates the economic landscape for the next 50 years, then dominates the politics, and with that they dominate the political and, and, uh, and military narrative. My sister is a historian and others have told me that when you have a chance to rewrite history, you control the future. This is also about changing the history of the past. That's dangerous. Victors write history. If we're not careful, we're going to create a situation where the history of the people who fought in the civil rights movement, that's going to be obliterated. How did Nelson Mandela go to prison? It was the American deputy ambassador who turned him in. Those facts of history will be conveniently discarded if we're not careful. And that's what's at stake the future of history and the future of knowledge. Coming up next, combating insider threats. The NSA's latest preoccupation since the disclosures by Edward Snowden created a firestorm. You will meet whistleblowers and hear their dramatic stories in the next episode of America's Surveillance State.